oral questions. Question oral, the Honourable Leader of the Opposition. How many police stations that are controlled by Beijing, how many are operating in Canada? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, as you know, it is completely unacceptable for a foreign government, especially a government like China's or others, it is unacceptable for them to be interfering with matters of Canadian involvement like our democracy, our academic institutions, government institutions. We will continue to make protecting Canadians a priority, and the RCMP is following up on all of these police stations. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition, how many? The Right Honourable Prime Minister, as the Leader of the Opposition knows very well, the RCMP is currently taking action against these illegal actions in Canada. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition, the Prime Minister has admitted that there are police stations. We were earlier told that all of those stations were closed. Later, we learned that that's not true. At least two are still operating. And his government used taxpayer, taxpayer money for those stations. So for a third time, will the Prime Minister tell us how many of these Beijing-operated police stations here in Canada? How many? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, as I said, the RCMP is responsible for carrying out all necessary investigations and pressing charges, if necessary, against all those who are interfering with our democracy. But if the Leader of the Opposition is so curious about the details of foreign interference, well, then all he has to do is accept the briefing that was offered by the intelligence services so that he can put an end to his ignorance of the details and learn the details on these serious matters like foreign interference. I would encourage the Leader of the Opposition to inform himself properly. First of all, the number of police stations controlled by a foreign dictatorship in Canada is not a detail. It would not be a detail if any government had foreign police stations operating on our soil. Second of all, all Canadians deserve to know the answer. The government claimed that it shut down all these police stations. Now we know there are two in operation and that the Prime Minister's government has given taxpayers money to help fund them. Simple question. How many of Beijing's police stations are operating on Canadian soil today? How many? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. You well know, and as Canadians well know, this government takes extremely seriously the issue of foreign interference and has since 2015 when we brought in significant measures to counter foreign interference and continue to. The RCMP is quite rightly charged with the responsibility of uh, investigating and following up on these reports of, uh, of uh, Beijing-funded police stations. But indeed, if the Leader of the Opposition is so curious... The Honour Right Honourable Prime Minister, I just want to remind everyone the way it works is you ask a question and then you listen to the answer, whether you like it or not. You can't keep asking the question over and over again while the person's speaking. So I just want to point that out. I'll let the, uh, maybe 30 seconds, uh, we'll bump it up. We won't take the full uh, amount, but uh, the, the Right Honourable Prime Minister, please. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, if uh, the Leader of the Opposition continues to have questions like many Canadians do on foreign interference, I would suggest that he actually takes up our security agencies on the offer they have made to him of getting briefed up on all the intelligence related to foreign interference so he doesn't have to hide behind, and I quote the report on this, a veil of ignorance and can actually work from the facts. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. The Prime Minister can brief all Canadians right now. Here, here, here. These are police stations that exist to harass and intimidate Canadian citizens on Canadian soil. No real country would allow a foreign dictatorship to run police stations on its soil. The Americans are arresting Beijing's agents in their country. So one last time, I'll give the Prime Minister the chance to answer the question. How many police stations 
how many, how many, and how many is Beijing operating on Canadian soil? The right honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, if the Leader of the Opposition were to take this issue of foreign interference seriously as an issue facing diaspora communities, as an issue facing Chinese Canadians, he would be interested in actually understanding the facts around foreign interference. But instead, he chooses to play partisan games, he chooses to make personal attacks against the former Governor General, instead of actually accepting uh, to take this issue seriously. He knows full well the RCMP's response responsibility is to do these investigations and make arrests, and they are actually following up on that. The Honourable Member for Belay chambly Mr. Speaker, Canada no longer has a democratic government worthy of the name. It has a Prime Minister who is refusing to clear up doubts about his willingness to cover up secrets that we are not yet even aware of. And yet we should ask people in Xinjiang or in Hong Kong how things are being dealt with by China or ask the Tibetans what the Chinese Communist Party is doing. Ask members in this House who have been intimidated how Mr. Xi Jinping does things. Does this Prime Minister not want to set things right before going into the history books as someone who is following the wishes of a hostile foreign power, the Right Honourable Prime Minister? Mr. Speaker, like the leader of the Conservative Party, the leader of the Bloc Québécois is making the choice to not apprise himself of the facts. He is making the choice to not consult the information that is being placed at his disposal. While we may not agree on certain things, we should not be able to disagree on facts. My colleague has a right to his opinions, but not a right to his own facts. And that is why we offered him the opportunity to get briefed on the confidential information, but he refused because he prefers to make attacks from a position of ignorance rather than learn about the real facts and take this seriously. The Honourable Member, this Prime Minister, just like China, is cultivating a culture of, of secrecy. Everything we've seen with David Johnston is ultimately contributing to this culture of secrecy, just like China might do. And everything that is being done is to try to turn our eyes away from the closeness between this regime in, in Canada and in China, perhaps even investor connections, and keeping documents secret. It is not up to David Johnson to determine what I or I not, what I can or cannot see. It's not up to him. What we need is an independent public inquiry. The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, we just heard directly from the leader of the Bloc Québécois that he is choosing not to familiarize himself with the facts. He's complaining about a culture of secrecy. He says he's frustrated about the fact that there is secret information from our intelligence agencies. For Lacombe, uh, what is it, uh, Mount, no, I don't know, Mountain View Lacombe, I believe. Uh, is, is just, I'm going to ask him just to keep it down, and, and many others as well. I just, uh, I'll let the uh, Honourable Prime Minister start over again, please. Monsieur le Président, le chef du Bloc Québécois se... Mr. Speaker, the leader of the Bloc Québécois is complaining in a very partisan fashion of a culture of secrecy, but the reality is that he knows very well that our intelligence agencies need to operate in such a way as to protect Canadians, especially when it's a matter of a foreign power like China, but he's choosing to remain mired in ignorance. He's refusing to look at the confidential information that we are ready to share, which would enable him to participate in this debate in a reasonable manner. Let me just interrupt. There seems to be a discussion happening in the back between both sides of the House. If you want to have a chat, could you please go into the hall or just go to one side or the other of the House? Don't shout at each other from one side to the other. That's not parliamentary. The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Maybe 10 minutes back, please. Mr. Speaker, like the leader of the Conservative Party, the leader of the Bloc Québécois is preferring to remain mired in ignorance rather than take real action to learn about the situation. This is all about playing partisan games. We take the matter of foreign interference seriously, and we would hope that the opposition would do the same. Burnaby South. 
Dan Stanton, a former CSIS counterintelligence officer, testified in committee. He said that a public inquiry into foreign interference is necessary. He, like many Canadians, is wondering what's going on. He said very clearly that there are safeguards that we can put in place to protect sensitive information. I agree with Mr. Stanton. Now, will the Prime Minister do the right thing and listen to Canadians, listen to this House, and listen to a former CSIS counterintelligence officer and vote in favor of our motion calling for a public inquiry? Here, here. Here, here. Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, I'll do one better than a former CSIS agent. Uh, the current leadership across our intelligence agencies and across the public service continue to say that the best way uh, to move forward on this is not with a public inquiry that would have to happen behind closed doors. There was many uh, testifying, many testifying at committees uh, expressing that perspective. But uh, to remove it from the political realm, we asked uh, an unimpeachable man of integrity, a former governor. General uh, selected by uh, Stephen Harper uh, to look into these matters deeply and make a determination whether a uh, public inquiry was the right mechanism or not. And he said, The Honourable Member for Burnaby South. The Prime Minister is not restoring confidence with the decisions he's taking. We need confidence restored. What will it take for this government to understand common sense? Last week, we learned that part of the Special Rapporteur's team is an ardent donor to the Liberal Party. Is that really an example of political independence? Could this Prime Minister finally put the interests of the country before his personal interests? Will he vote for our motion to create a public inquiry? Will he do that? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. The matter of foreign interference, Mr. Speaker, is a matter that is critical and very serious for our democracy and our institutions. That is why we have implemented a number of measures, such as committees of parliamentarians, expert committees like NSARA, a process during the election campaign, an independent expert who is evaluating everything we're doing and making recommendations. And that expert indeed found that the elections of 2019 and 2021 ultimately did not have their outcome changed, and they will continue their work. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition, a real Prime Minister would never allow a foreign dictatorship to operate police stations on our territory. But this Prime Minister allowed Beijing to run these stations for at least six months. So my question, how many Agents of Beijing have been arrested here in Canada because those police stations were being run here in Canada at a time when many of them were arrested in the U.S. The Right Honourable Prime Minister, Mr. Speaker, the leader of the Conservative Party knows that it's not up to police officers or to politicians, rather, to direct the police in their operations. However, we are ensuring that the RCMP is following up and investigating on these matters of foreign interference and these Chinese police stations. Meanwhile, the leader of the official opposition is choosing to remain blind to the facts. He's refusing to attend briefings on the facts about Chinese interference. That's his choice, because he wants to continue engaging in unfounded political attacks. No. The honorable leader of the opposition. Well, what's really not serious is that we don't have the laws we need to ensure that the RCMP arrests Beijing operatives who created these police stations. Why not? And why is it that the Americans were able to arrest Beijing operatives who were running these police stations in the U.S.? There in the U.S., they have laws that the Conservative Party has been asking for for years, especially a registry of foreign agents. Why is it that the Prime Minister is protecting these Beijing police stations instead of creating legislation so that these operatives can be arrested? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, indeed, we are in the middle of creating such a registry of foreign agents. That's the responsible thing to do. But the reality is that the, op the opposition leader's decision to refuse to attend the briefings so that he can learn about the intelligence and what's really going on 
that is mind-boggling and shows that he is not interested in fixing the problem. He is not interested in defending the interests of Chinese communities that have been exploited and attacked by Beijing. Instead, he's only interested in partisan mudslinging. It's all an act with this guy. He would have you believe that if he committed me to secrecy and forced me to take an oath of silence, that that would somehow close the <laughs> Beijing police stations here in Canada? Of course not. What we need is a strong law that will allow our police to arrest them. The question is very simple. Why is it that the Americans have been able to shut down the, the Beijing police stations in their country and arrest the agents involved with them, while in this country, the, this Prime Minister has been able to do neither? Uh, honorable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, any serious politician in this place should understand how the Security of Information Act actually works, uh, particularly someone who has sat in cabinet and who was Canada's Minister of Elections. Uh, but the reality is, if the member opposite doesn't understand how the Security of Information Act works, we would be happy to provide a briefing to him from officials to explain how the Security of Information Act, so he can understand that it would be okay for him to take a a briefing on the facts of foreign interference so he could be better informed in his questions uh, and his uh, challenges to government. The reality is the Honourable Leader of the Opposition. The Prime Minister. Order. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. They don't have to brief me on the laws. I've actually read them, Mr. Speaker. Section 12.1 of the National Security and Intelligence Committee Act says that I would not only be silenced from speaking about matters broadly, but I would be prevented from debating them on the floor of the House of Commons, which is exactly what the Prime Minister wants. But he's not going to get it. I won't be gagged. I won't be silenced. I will continue to seek the truth. And here's the truth that I want him to finally speak. We've known that there are foreign police stations operating on Canadian soil. We know the Prime Minister's government has given them tax dollars. How much did he give them? Yeah. Right, Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, hiding behind, quote, a veil of ignorance is very characteristic for a leader who has no interest. I, I'm going to interrupt the Honourable. <laughs> Right, Honourable Prime Minister, I got some complaints because there were some people shouting from this side when the opposition leader was asking. I'm going to ask the same courtesy from both sides of each other. I don't think it's that hard. It's not that complicated. When somebody is speaking, we don't speak. The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker. Hiding behind, quote, a veil of ignorance is very characteristic for a leader who has no interest in actual facts. There's nothing stopping him right now from getting cleared, briefed, and disagreeing with the former Governor General's conclusions if he so chooses. Regardless of his opinions, he is entitled to those. He is not entitled to his own facts. Please. Mr. Speaker, I really encourage the Leader of the Opposition to get briefed on the, the Honourable Leader of the Opposition. All Canadians are entitled to yeah, the facts, yeah. Mr. Speaker. Yeah. And that's why we want a public inquiry. We know that Beijing gave $140,000 to the Trudeau Foundation. We know that when the scandal broke, he, he named Mr. Rosenberg to look into it. Rosenberg is with the Trudeau Foundation. When the scandal exploded further, he named Mr. Johnston also a member of the Trudeau Foundation. And what did he do? He named another judge from the Trudeau Foundation to look into the conflict of interest. Is the Prime Minister afraid of a public inquiry because he's run out of members of the Trudeau Foundation? <laughs> run out. Yeah. The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, while the Leader of the Opposition uh, continues on his personal and his partisan attacks, uh, we're going to continue to deal with... I'm sorry. Uh What part, I have a question for all of you to reflect on. I don't want anybody to shut, shout the answer out. This is, this is not a question I want an answer. What part of while somebody is speaking, we sit quietly and listen, do we not understand? Right, 
me an email if you want, once we're done, and you can explain to me, because I don't understand that. The Right Honourable Prime Minister, from the top, please. Mr. Speaker, once again, we see the level to which the Leader of the Opposition on this very serious issue has nothing to offer other than partisan attacks and personal attacks, uh, rather than actually dealing with the substance of this serious issue. To deal with the substance of this serious issue, we have offered him, I directed intelligence agencies to offer him secure briefings so that he can actually understand the facts underlying both the governor, former Governor General's report and uh, the issue of foreign interference, and he has simply refused because he doesn't want anything, like facts particularly, to get in the way of a good partisan argument. Here, here. Here the opposition. Canadians have a right to the facts, Mr. Speaker. Beijing sent $140,000 to the Trudeau Foundation. It caused a scandal. And the Prime Minister appointed Mr. Rosenberg to, to look into it, but he's a member of the Trudeau Foundation. Then the scandal came out even more, so he appointed Mr. Johnston, also a member of the Trudeau Foundation. And to be absolutely sure that there wasn't a conflict of interests, Mr. Johnston appointed someone else who was a member of the Trudeau Foundation. Is there a reason that the Prime Minister doesn't want a public inquiry? Is it that he can't find anyone else who's a member of the Trudeau Foundation to run it? The Right Honourable Prime Minister, Mr. Speaker, the leader of the opposition has on several occasions made remarks like, Canadians have a right to all the facts, but he should understand that there are people who work for our armed forces, our intelligence services, who are working under very difficult, complex and vulnerable circumstances in foreign nations in order to protect Canadians and in order to uncover the secrets of countries who wish to harm us, the fact that he doesn't seem to understand how much we owe here in this place and for all Canadians, how much we owe these people protection and care, well, that shows that the Honourable Member for belle chambly Well, I'd like to give another example, Mr. Speaker. The National Assembly of Quebec is unanimously asking for information about Ottawa's interference in the 95 referendum, and yet the Prime Minister prefers secrecy. This Parliament is asking that an independent commissioner be responsible for the information, the briefings, but once again, the Prime Minister prefers secrecy. Mr. Speaker, this Prime Minister is either weak or useful to a foreign power. Who is this Prime Minister working for, his country or the financial interests of the friends of the Liberal regime, the Right Honourable Prime Minister? Mr. Speaker, he starts with the 1995 referendum and he ends up talking about, oh, money and the ethnic vote. Look what he just said. This Bloc Québécois is just trying to go back to old arguments. And they're harping on these old arguments. <laughs> I've looked through the history of Parliament, and there was one case where the Speaker decided that he had had enough of question period, and he left. In fact, the entire sitting was adjourned for around 30 minutes, and I'm really in the mood for that today, so I'm going to ask the Prime Minister to start over from the beginning. Mr. Speaker, the leader of the Bloc Québécois is turning back the clock from 2023 to 1995, the referendum. And even at the end of his question, he said something that was very similar to money and the ethnic vote. So it's quite humorous to see that the Bloc Québécois doesn't care about foreign interference. They just want to pick a fight with Ottawa. We, on the other hand, take these issues seriously. We will continue to work with all of the necessary seriousness on these issues that are important to Canadians while we continue to deliver a strong, growing economy and while we continue fighting climate change. The Honourable Member for belle chambly I have a hypothesis for you, Mr. Speaker. Why you're seeing this behaviour in the House? Have we ever seen a Prime Minister who has so little worthiness of the functions that he occupies? Illegal election funding, industrial espionage, Trudeau Foundation, 
contempt for intelligence services, and many, many other problems. We know so much about the reasons for which we should be asking for a real public inquiry, not for the, this buddy-buddy act with his friend. When will this prime minister put an end to this, these policies that are harmful for Quebec and very, very, very helpful to China? The right honorable prime minister. Mr. Speaker, the leader of the Bloc Québécois just said, we know plenty about it. Well, Mr. Speaker, he doesn't actually know plenty about it because he has refused to be briefed on the confidential information from our security agencies. He has turned down the opportunity to hear the facts about the real issues here. Instead, he prefers to engage in this kind of partisan mudslinging. And he likes to keep picking fights with us, whereas Canadians, all Canadians, including Quebecers, deserve to have the representatives take the matter of foreign interference seriously, and that's what we're doing. The BC the Center for Dis Disease Control revealed today that it now costs over $1,200 a month for a basket of nutritious food for the average family in that province. This is an explosion of costs that have taken place under this Prime Minister. Those numbers come from a year ago, and the same report says the high prices are higher still now. Now the Prime Minister's solution for that is a 61 cent a litre carbon tax. They'll push gas prices well over $2 a litre and increase the cost to farmers and truckers who bring us our food. How much will that increase the cost of food for Canadians? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Speaker, we've seen the extents to which, not just for the past seven and a half years, but for the decade before that, Conservatives refused to take the fight against climate change seriously, refused to accept that the cost to Canadians from coast to coast to coast would increase, get increasingly large as the years went on. Well, uh, over the past seven years, Mr. Speaker, we have stepped up in the fight against climate change, including with a price on pollution that puts more money back in the pockets of eight out of ten Canadians. We're going to continue to step up with a grocery rebate uh, to help with Canadians with the high cost of food. We're going to continue con creating good jobs. We're going to continue being the leader of the opposition. Their carbon tax is not an environmental plan. It is a tax plan. It has done nothing to meet any targets, and it has done nothing to reduce the cost of climate change. What it has done is increase the cost of food, because when you tax the farmers who make the food and the truckers who ship the food, then you tax the food itself. Now, the Prime Minister's plan is not to triple the carbon tax, but to quadruple the carbon tax. Well, he adds more and more, 61 centiliters. So my question is, how much will his 61 centiliter carbon tax add to the monthly basket of food for Canadians? How much? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, once again, we see that uh, the leader of the official opposition is uh, not willing to let the facts get in the way of a great political argument. And even then, it's not that a great an argument, Mr. Speaker. It's just a bumper sticker that he can stick on to, to scare Canadians with. Uh, the reality is we are delivering uh, with dental benefits, uh, with a, a grocery rebate, and with a carbon price that is putting more money back in the pockets of 8 out of 10 Canadians. Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, while he continues to cross his arms and vote against things like the dental benefit, we've delivered on 1,100 kids in his riding uh, dental benefits that have made a real difference. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Mr. Speaker, if the facts that I have just quoted from the BC Centre for Disease Control are false, then, then maybe he can tell me what the real numbers are. I've asked him, and given that he wants to bring in a 61 cent a litre carbon tax. Increase gas and diesel prices by 61 cent a litre on the farmers that produce the food and the truckers that bring it to the grocery store. How much will that tax increase add to the monthly cost of groceries for the average Canadian family? How much? Right, Honourable Prime Minister. What Canadians know clearly is the inaction by a decade of a Conservative government and the continued resistance of Conservatives to take action on fighting climate change is costing them incredible amounts. How many uh, homes have been lost in Nova Scotia? How many people affected and evacuated across Alberta? How many people in the Northwest Territories affected now? In New Brunswick, people in Central Canada worried about forest fires coming there in the coming weeks and months. The reality is extremely
extreme weather events are getting more and more expensive for Canadians, which is why we need to continue to lead on climate change while supporting Canadians. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Mr. Speaker. All of those things have happened with this carbon tax in place. Yeah. This carbon tax has done nothing to reduce emissions, let alone to stop storms and other weather events. So that is a completely, that is nothing more than another act from this Prime Minister. Let's get back to the question. My question was very specific. We know now that a British Columbia family has to spend $1,200 a month on groceries just to feed their kids. He wants to raise the tax up to 61 cents a litre on the farmers and truckers who bring us our food. How much will that add to the grocery bill of an average family? How much? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Here's the problem with the Leader of the Opposition. He is in love with the sound of his own voice and his own attacks, but he doesn't actually check the facts. The Right Honourable Prime Minister, from the top, please. Mr. Speaker, here is the issue with the Leader of the Opposition, who is so in love with the sound of his own voice that he doesn't actually check the facts. Mr. Speaker, he's talking about uh, our price on pollution when the reality is BC has its own price on pollution. The federal backstop doesn't even apply in BC. Uh, he is uh, mixing everything uh, for political arguments, for partisan attacks to try and scare Canadians, and to cover for the fact that he has no plan to fight climate change and therefore has no plan uh, for the future of the Canadian economy. Well, member for Burnaby South. The Wabasin Dakota First Nations hasn't had a proper school in a long time. I've been to the school. Students are forced to learn in portables. They don't have proper running water, don't have heating and cooling in the winter and in the summer. And the school itself has a roof that's caving in. There's black mold everywhere. This is often the reality for First Nations and Indigenous kids. Will? I have to ask. I'm going to ask everyone one last time to calm down and be quiet while we listen to whoever's asking and answering the question. The Honourable Member for Burnaby South from the top, please. Wapiton, Dakota First Nations hasn't had a properly functioning school in a long time. I visited the First Nations and I saw the school. They have to operate in portables. The portables don't have proper heating and cooling. These portables don't have running water in the winter. I went to the school itself and the building main structure, the roof is caving in and there's black mold. This is often the reality for Indigenous children in our country. So when will this Prime Minister take this matter seriously and ensure that this First Nation has a proper school so Indigenous kids can learn in a safe and secure surrounding? Here, here. The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, I agree with my Honourable colleague. Uh, we need to do more. We have built hundreds of new schools across this country and in Indigenous communities uh, over the past uh, seven and a half years, but there is much more to do. We will continue uh, to work hand in hand with Indigenous peoples on record investments, uh, on partnerships to build schools, health centres, senior centres, uh, to solve outstanding land claim issues, to install boil water, uh, sorry, uh, to install wastewater uh, and uh, water 
treatment plants to ensure uh, drinking water across this country. These are things that we're doing and we're continuing to do, and I appreciate the member opposite's hard work on bringing them forward as well. The Honourable Member for churchill kuatnook Aski. Mr. Speaker, a priest accused and arrested of abuse and the forcible confinement of an eight-year-old girl. More victims are coming forward. Families are in shock. A First Nation is in shock. This isn't history. This is happening now in Little Grand Rapids First Nation in 2023. My question is, what is the government doing at this time to support the community? And what will the government do to work with the community to support its clear calls for accountability? The Prime Minister. Speaker, this is a horrific situation uh, that never should have happened any time. Uh, we know it happened decades ago and never should have, and this one happened just recently, and it never should have. We have obviously reached out to the community, are working closely with them on what is needed uh, for healing uh, and uh, for moving forward, but we are also serious about accountability and ensuring uh, that these kinds of, uh, uh, these kinds of abuses never happen again. The Honourable Member for Fredericton. Mr. Speaker, we know all too well there are tragic consequences and costs to the climate crisis. Just this week, we are seeing unprecedented wildfires back home in New Brunswick and Nova Scotia, and my heart goes to the people facing these incredibly difficult circumstances. We know that the cost of inaction is far too high. We must work towards rapidly decarbonizing our society and ensuring Atlantic Canada protects our precious ecosystems and builds a resilient economy. Can the Prime Minister please tell us what this government is doing to address the climate crisis while positioning Atlantic Canada as a hub for renewable energy and clean tech for the future? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, I thank my colleague from Fredericton for her leadership on climate change and her hard work on the file. Canadians are thinking about our friends on the East Coast and across the country who are impacted by wildfires right now. It's a reminder that climate change is real and its devastating impacts cannot be ignored. Unfortunately, the Conservative Party still doesn't have a climate plan, which means they don't have a plan for the future of the Canadian economy. On this side, we're investing in and leveraging technologies that are cutting emissions and creating good jobs in Come By Chance in Newfoundland and Labrador, for example. And we're making sure that it's no longer free to pollute while giving Canadians money back. Here, here. Honourable Leader of the Opposition. So, <laughs> the high school drama teacher over here accuses others of liking the sounds of their own voices. This from a guy who, if he were made of chocolate, he would eat himself. <laughs> do that until after he answers my question, which I keep asking. It's about the cost of groceries in BC and everywhere else. Now he's right, the NDP has already put in a carbon tax there, but he wants to force them to increase it by almost 40 cents to 61 cents a litre, a federally imposed tax by the costly coalition of the Liberals and NDP. How much will it add to the cost of groceries for the average family? How much? Honourable Prime Minister. Yes, Mr. Speaker, I was a high school teacher before getting into politics, and I'm having a little trouble remembering what exactly the job that the Leader of the Opposition had before getting into politics. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, we have a plan to fight climate change. We have a plan to continue to move forward on supporting Canadians with a grocery rebate, with a growing economy, with great middle-class jobs. Uh, we're delivering health care supports for Canadians from coast to coast to coast, delivering dental care that has helped 300,000 kids uh, access dental care over the past number of months, including 1,100 in his own writing. Uh, Mr. Speaker, we will continue to be there for Canadians. Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Yes, and uh, yes, and he left right in the middle of the semester, and I'm having trouble remembering why. Oh! Now, Mr. Speaker. He certainly wasn't a math teacher. He certainly
certainly was not a math teacher. His own finance minister says the deficits pour fuel on the inflationary fire. Right before she introduced $60 billion more spend deficit spending measures. How much will that add to the inflation rate Canadians have to play? How much? Hey, hey. The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, while the Leader of the Opposition continues to talk down the Canadian economy, we have the lowest deficit in the G7. We have the best debt-to-GDP uh, ratio uh, of the G7. And the fact is, Mr. Speaker, uh, the Canadians can expect that there be arguments back and forth about fiscal responsibility. Uh, but if they check the international bond rating agencies, the people who are designed and whose jobs it is to evaluate the fiscal responsibility of a given government, they continue to give us a triple A rating for fiscal responsibility. Canadians know we are on the right track. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Mr. Speaker, it's not just me that acknowledges that deficits pour fuel on the inflationary fire. It's his own finance minister. In fact, she said that two weeks before she introduced her budget. And guess what followed her budget? A spike in the inflation rate that the Prime Minister promised would only ever go down. What do you know? Dumping $60 billion of fuel on the inflationary fire actually makes prices go up. So did the Finance Department calculate how much this extra $60 billion of inflationary spending would add to the Consumer Price Index? How much? The right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker. The Leader of the Opposition likes to talk about being in disagreement with the investments we've made into the Canadian economy, but perhaps he would be uh, open uh, with Canadians and uh, share uh, how he would not have funded childcare at $10 a day right across the country for Canadians, that he wouldn't be delivering dental care benefits, including to 1,100 kids in his, uh, in his riding. Uh, he wouldn't uh, be stepping up with targeted supports, with GST doubling, reba rebate doubling uh, for 11 million Canadians. Canadians. Uh, he is not saying where he would be cutting, what programs That's he would right. be slashing, and how he would be hurting Canadians. Uh, while the Leader of the Opposition. No, I've been very clear. I would get rid of the $35 billion uh, incompetent infrastructure bank, yeah. Mr. Speaker. I'd get rid of the $54 million Arrive Can app that didn't work and, and wasn't necessary. I wouldn't blow billions of dollars buying back hunting rifles from lawful and licensed yeah. Canadians yeah. instead of going after serious criminals. The list of waste and corruption goes on and on and on. My question question, though, is how much is all of this spending adding to inflation? John Manley, former Liberal finance minister, said, just like the current finance minister has said, that when you add deficits, you add inflation. So the question again, how much extra inflation will the $60 billion in budget deficits cause? Yeah. The Right Honourable Prime Minister. I thank uh, the Leader of the Opposition for trying to clear things up, but the fact is no Canadians doubted that he was going to uh, pull back our measures uh, to fight uh, to fight gun control, gun crime. Uh, we're moving forward on increasing gun control. We banned assault-style weapons. We put a freeze on the market for handguns. And the Conservative Party, in the pockets of the gun lobby, has continued to insist that no, they will roll back those measures. They will not continue uh, to protect Canadians and communities across the country. Uh, that is their approach. Our approach is to continue to invest in Canadians to lift millions of people out of poverty and create millions of great jobs. L'honorable député de Chambly. The honorable member for Belle Chambly. Mr. Speaker, Canada is dragging Quebec into a crisis that is going to destroy democracy by covering it in secrecy. We're going to go to the very end of the story. How can he explain to Quebecers and Canada that he is going to disdain the vote of a, an elected majority in this House? Everyone is an elected official of Parliament, just as he is. The Right Honourable Prime Minister, Mr. Speaker, we're going to continue to work with everyone in this House to fight foreign interference, and we take it seriously. The leader of the Bloc Québécois only has to demonstrate that he's open to understanding the effect of the issue, to see the intelligence reports that have been collected on what happened, but he refused. He'd rather hide the truth from himself in order to continue these partisan attacks. 
that's not a responsible approach worthy of our democracy. I encourage him to participate in the required briefings, the Honorable Member for Belle Chambly. The facts. He just needs to reveal the facts. The Prime Minister is protecting someone or something. Who? What? What skeletons are dancing in the Trudeau Foundation's closet? How far will he go to protect his secrets? And what's China doing? And who is it doing it to? By successfully intimidating the entire Liberal government. The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, the leader of the Bloc Epica wants to know who I'm protecting. First of all, Canadians. By fighting foreign interference. Protecting Canadians of Chinese origin who are often targeted by foreign interference. I'm protecting our institutions and our democracy by creating mechanisms to fight Chinese interference. And I will continue to protect the men and women who put their lives on the line to reveal secrets and to find China's secrets and those of other countries that will us harm and thereby ensure our national safety. Position. Monsieur le Président, la ministre des Finances. Mr. Speaker, the Minister of Finance admitted that deficits pour gas on the inflationary fire. Two weeks later, she announced $60 billion more of gas for that fire. For the Prime Minister, how much is that inflationary deficit that she added in this budget alone increase the rate of inflation on the backs of Canadians? How much? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, the Conservative leader continues to insist on austerity. We will continue to be there to invest in Canadians. And while he proposes cuts, cutting programs, cutting services to Canadians, we will continue to help Canadians rise out of poverty, 2.7 million people over the last few years. We're going to continue to help seniors by lowering retirement age back to 65 after the, they had raised it to 67. We'll continue to be there for youth and families with daycare, the right honourable leader of the opposition. Le un sur cinq Canadiens. One out of five Canadians are skipping meals because they can't pay for the groceries. They're already living in austerity. 1.5 million people have to get supplies at food banks. They're already living in austerity. The nine out of 10 young people who believe they will never be able to buy a home are living in austerity. The only person who isn't is the prime minister because he's causing austerity for everyone else. How much is that additional $60 billion in his budget going to add to inflation, the Right Honourable Prime Minister? If I understand correctly, the Conservative Party's austerity plan is to say, look, Canadians are already facing difficulties, so that's fine. We'll just add on with fewer expenditures, fewer investments, and less assistance for families who need it. Maybe that's why they voted against the dental care program that we're offering to children. 300,000 children from coast to coast can access dental care, which they couldn't get before. 1,500 in his riding of Carleton. But he voted against it because for him, austerity is the principle to maintain above all the honorable leader of the opposition. Minister for eight years. The half trillion dollars of inflationary deficits he has enacted are causing the inflation that Canadians are paying. They are not the solution to the inflation. After eight years of this Prime Minister, one in five Canadians skip meals because they can't eat. 1.5 million go to food banks, some of them asking for help with medical assistance and dying, not because they're sick, but because they are hungry. He has driven people out of their homes and into tent cities as nine in 10 young people believe they will never be able to own a home. How much is he going to make them pay before the suffering ends? Right. The right honorable
Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, we hear Mr. Uh, the Leader of the Opposition continue uh, to spread his message that Canada is broken right across the country, so we should just throw up our hands and give up uh, and stop spending to invest in Canadians, stop supporting uh, low-income Canadians, stop creating great jobs, stop uh, drawing in great factories like Volkswagen, uh, stop working to secure Stellantis investments. Uh, this is what the Conservatives' plan is, to throw up their hands and say, everything's broken so let's just burn it down. Well, Canadians don't feel that, Mr. Speaker. Canadians roll up our sleeves and we solve the challenges that we're facing. That's what Canadians are doing every day across the country. That's what they're going to continue to do. L'honorable député de Laval, Les Îles. Monsieur le Président, après des semaines... Mr. Speaker, after weeks of study, but mostly obstruction by the Conservative Party, We've finally finished clause-by-clause clause review of the budget bill. That's one more step, enabling us to deliver the support that people in my constituency and across Canada need. Can the Prime Minister tell us more about the importance of passing the budget bill as quickly as possible? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Merci, le député de la Mr. Speaker, I thank the member for Laval Les Îles for his important question and his hard work. Just like him, I'm disappointed that the Conservatives tried to block essential support measures in the budget, namely attacks to fight against home flipping, a deduction for people to buy tools when they work in the trades, and support for workers. Their partisan games at committee are blocking the passage of our budget. But I hope that everyone here, including the Conservatives, will unite to deliver for Canadians and get them what they need. So the Prime Minister tells Canadians, stop complaining, you've never had it so good. Well, the nine and 10 young people who can't afford a home because Housing costs have doubled under this Prime Minister. Rent has doubled. The average mortgage payment has doubled. The needed down payment for an average house has doubled. The, the inflation rate has hit the highest level in 40 years and now is back on the rise. They might beg to differ. So will the Prime Minister stop try trying to silence Canadians' voices and start reversing the policies that have caused the damage in the first place. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Prime Minister. We're going to continue to grow the economy. We're going to continue to create great, well-paying jobs for Canadians right across the country because that's what Canadians continue to need. That's what we've been doing over these past years. The fact that uh, Mr. the Leader of the Opposition uh, suggests we should be growing less, we should be seeing less wage growth across the country, uh, maybe reveals a little more about his economic thinking than anyone else's. But at the same time as we do that, we're going to continue to invest in programs and supports for first time home buyers, uh, for low income renters, uh, for construction of new rental homes by working in partnership with municipalities. We're going to continue to deliver. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Mr. Speaker, he only delivers for himself. And we're not growing. We have the, the slowest per capita GDP growth of any government since the Great Depression under this Prime Minister. Under this Prime Minister, eight years of this Prime Minister, housing costs have doubled. One in five eating at food banks. 1.5 million, sorry, 1.5 million eating at food banks. One in five skipping meals because they cannot afford food. Now interest rates, which his government said would stay low for long, are skyrocketing because of his deficits. How much have interest rates had to go up to accommodate his 60 billion in new deficits? How much? The right honourable prime minister. Here's a thought experiment for Canadians. Imagine how much worse off we'd be if the Conservatives plan on uh, not encouraging vaccinations uh, had led during the pandemic. If their reliance on ideology and conspiracy theories instead of science and experts had governed our pandemic for sports, uh, response, uh, the Canadian economy. I'm, I'm sorry, uh, I'm going to have to ask the Honourable Prime Minister to stop for a second. 
We had started getting better. Now all of a sudden everybody's getting excited again. Maybe it's because the end of question period is coming and maybe I'll just skip to the last question and then work my way back and that might work out better. But I'm going to let the Prime Minister continue and we'll see if I have to resort to that. The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, we are a government grounded in facts and evidence, uh, and that is part of why we got through the pandemic better than uh, most other countries around the world that we're comparable to. The fact is the Conservatives' reliance on conspiracy theories, unwillingness to promote vaccination, uh, would have harmed Canadians significantly over these past years of the recovery. We've seen significant job growth and economic growth uh, post-pandemic, and we will continue to be there to support Canadians who need it by investing in food banks, investing in, in uh, countering homelessness, investing in supporting families from coast to coast to coast. That was good. Congratulations. You all came down a notch. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. He says he's investing in food banks. He's definitely increased the business at food banks, Mr. <laughs> Speaker, with about 1.5 million people eating there. But instead of reversing the policies that cause that hunger, he divides. He divides to distract. He reaches back, he reaches back and uses the pandemic as a point of division to tear this country apart just like he did then and he only did it because under eight years of him, life costs more, work doesn't pay, housing costs have doubled, drugs, disorder, crime and chaos have reigned in the street and the country is more divided than ever. Why doesn't he reverse those damaging actions rather than trying to divide Canadians some more? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. The Prime Minister is getting a standing ovation. He hasn't even started yet. Please continue. Mr. Speaker, we have uh, heard the uh, Leader of the Opposition again and again. He believes that everything is broken in Canada, uh, that we should all just throw up our hands. Well, he's wrong about that, Mr. Speaker. And when he talks about the economic record of the past few years and seems to ignore the pandemic because it was inconvenient for him, his own behaviour during the pandemic, his own mistrust of science and evidence, his own encouragement of disorder and... and, uh, and, uh, and, and uh, Honourable Prime Minister, maybe about 20 seconds worth, please. Mr. Speaker, it is inconvenient for the Leader of the Opposition for uh, us to talk about what happened during the pandemic, uh, even though it had a deep and serious impact on Canadians, on families, uh, on our economy, uh, and we were there to support them. We were there grounded in science, ensuring that everyone was kept safe with vaccination programs, with science and evidence and supports. The reality is, Mr. Speaker, uh, we will continue to be there for Canadians. We will continue to not believe believe Canada is broken, but to know we're, we're, we're building together. The Honourable Member for Vaughan Woodbridge. Good afternoon, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, parents across my riding of Vaughan Woodbridge and the City of Vaughan are again telling me how their children now have better access to dental care, clean teeth and bright smiles. Would the Prime Minister provide an update on Canada's debt? Up the Honourable Member for Vaughan Woodbridge. I can hardly hear his question. The Honourable Member for Vaughan Woodbridge from the top, please. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, parents across my riding of Vaughan Woodbridge and the City of Honour again telling me how their children now have better access to dental care, clean teeth, and bright smiles. Would the Prime Minister provide an update on Canada's dental care plan and how it's impacting Canadian families? from coast to coast to coast. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Right Honourable Prime Minister. Speaker, I want to thank the member for Vaughan Widgebridge for his question and his dedication to his constituents. We introduced the Canada Dental Benefit because we believe that no parent should have to choose between the health of their children and putting food on the table. And today I can announce that the Canada Dental Benefit has now helped 300,000 kids across the country go to the dentist, including 1,100 kids in the riding of Carlton. It's all part of our plan to make life more affordable for families, and it's a real shame that the Conservatives continue to stand against dental benefit for low-income Canadians. Honourable Member for Courtney Alberni. 
Mr. Speaker, tomorrow, a year ago, most of the Liberal caucus and all Conservatives teamed up to defeat Bill C-216 for a health-based approach to substance use. If it had passed today, we would have a multifaceted faceted plan to fight the toxic drug crisis based on the recommendations of the government's own expert task force. Instead, thousands more families have lost loved ones from poison drugs purchased on the street. So when will this government deliver a comprehensive plan to keep people who use drugs alive and provide no fee on demand treatment for those who need help now when the right honorable prime minister mr speaker we know how devastating the opioid epidemic is uh, for families right across the country and that is why we've continued to step up grounded in science and evidence and working in partnership with others i uh, salute uh, the uh, the intention of the member opposite to contribute to this debate, but as we've worked concretely on the ground with partners, including with the government of BC, for example, to move forward on de decriminalization uh, in a way that is showing positive impacts across BC, we will continue to be grounded in evidence as we take action to save lives and keep Canadians safe. Mr. Speaker. In an article by journalist Daniel Leblanc, we discovered that the RCMP is preparing to offer additional protection services to a dozen senior executives and possibly some ministers. We're all aware that the number of threats and aggressive speeches, whether in person or online, is increasing. The risks are real. We shouldn't wait for an unfortunate event to happen before we all say, oh, we should have done something. It's therefore time for the government and this parliament to show political courage and provide all ministers and political party leaders with a bodyguard, as is already the case in Quebec at the National Assembly. Can the Prime Minister tell us if he intends to introduce a measure like this in Ottawa? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, I thank my honourable colleague for his question and his concern, which is one that we share. Over the last several years, We've seen an increase in polarization and the toxicity and the level of hate among discourse in Canada, especially hate directed towards parliamentarians. We have to do everything necessary to keep those who serve democracy safe. This goes to the very basis of defending our democracy itself. We are looking into real measures to increase safety of ministers, and we're working with the Sergeant-at-Arms to ensure security for all parliamentarians. It being 3.25 p.m., pursuant to order made on June 23, 2022, the House will now proceed to the taking of the deferred recorded division on the motion of Ms. Kwan relating to the business of supply.